Hey guys, this is Robert Breedlove from the What Is Money Show. And as you've learned by watching this show, Bitcoin is the single most important asset you can own in the 21st century. And one of the most important companies in Bitcoin today is Nidig. Nidig's mission is to facilitate financial security for all. They accomplish this by bringing a high level of professionalization and sophistication to the Bitcoin marketplace. As a true game changer in the industry, Nidig is safely unlocking the power of Bitcoin for forward-thinking individuals and institutions alike. By using Nidig, you will gain access to an end-to-end -end institutional-grade platform, providing Bitcoin OTC transactions, Bitcoin collateralized borrowing, secure custody, asset management, derivatives, financing, market research, and more. And all of these services meet the highest regulatory, governance, and audit standards. Led by Robbie Gutman, Yin Zhao, and Ross Stevens, Nidig has absolutely exploded onto the Bitcoin scene recently and is leading the way for ongoing institutional adoption in this nascent asset class. So please be sure to check out Nidig as a single source for all your Bitcoin needs. Welcome back to the What Is Money show. I'm your host, Robert Breedlove, and I'm sitting here again with Mr. Dominic Frisbee, uh, author of the book, Daylight Robbery. Um, and other books as well about the history of money and its relationship specifically with taxation and civilization. And Dominic, so last time we talked about money as a communications tool, um, as you said, not only for prices, but also um, for communicating, it's been used to communicate other forms of value as well. And one of those being, uh, I I guess you could say propaganda is kind of a distortion of value or the attempted distortion of, of perception or values and others. And I wonder if we could talk a bit about that, how, when and how money has been used as propaganda throughout history. Well, I think one way or the other, probably ever since there's been money, it's been, it's been exploited for, for, for propaganda purposes. Um, and some, you know, propagandizing good governments and other times propagandizing not such good governments mm -hmm. um but you're right we we took money is a form of communication and we talked about the the um the first uh uh the the cable the first cable under the atlantic and the the price being communicated across the the um across the uh, cable by telegraph i guess telegraph i suppose it was mm. and then they knew that the two bodies on either side of the cable were reputable and therefore they were able to agree the first exchange rate between um uh, uh us dollars and, and the pound and you know so and as communication technology has evolved so has so has money and i think even if you look at something like bitcoin today you know one of the reasons it's been able to go is you know the digital the internet instantaneous communication copying and sending links and so on so there's that side of communication to money there's also the side that it communicates um and by the way we talked about propaganda and money like bitcoin it's it's completely voluntary Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's one of the most effective propaganda campaigns ever invented in the history of technology. You know, as soon as somebody invests in Bitcoin, suddenly they're a Bitcoiner. You've got your little Bitcoin tattoo on your yeah. arm. Everyone's got their laser eyes. Yeah. You know, I spent the last couple of weeks, as you probably know, um, <laughs> projecting these messages on the outside of the Bank of England, uh, much <laughs> to the amusement of everybody. And, yeah. you know, these are all different forms of propaganda. So, you know, Bitcoin's as guilty, if that's the right word of propaganda, as any other money system has been. Yeah, it's a meme, other, meme machine, right? Yeah, but yeah. memes are propaganda. But another form of communication um, that money is essential for is the communication of value. And, you know, if something costs this and something costs that, um, human beings understand all sorts of things by that and of course you know we we talk about stuff but often what we do says more yes <laughs> about what we yeah. think than, when, than we actually say right. and what we what is communicated in prices informs what we do mm -hmm. and 
you know, it's essential. It really is essential to an economy that its money is sound, and uh, because if the money isn't sound, then the value of stuff is going to be there's going to be all sorts of false information in there. Mm-hmm. And you know, we all know how fiat money pumps up asset prices and pumps up housing prices, and it it's just distorted messages. So, you know, we again we talked about truth, but if you want. A, a, a truth to be communicated, then the money must be sound. There's this Absolutely. relationship between soundness and truth and beauty. But then coming back to the issue of propaganda, with the very first coins that were stamped, you would have, they were usually stamped with the heads of gods. Uh, and then I suppose the sort of crossover point was around about the time of Alexander the Great, uh, one of the first you know, empires of, of early times, if you like. And I think he, he reached as far as India on one side and Carthage, which is, you know, East Africa on the other side. So it's pretty extensive um, from East to West, his conquest. And everywhere he went, he would take the existing money, <laughs> melt it down. You know, he, wherever he conquered, he'd raid the gold and silver voids. He'd melt, particularly in Persia, he did this. He'd melt the money down and then remint it with a stamp of, on one side it would be uh, Hercules, and on the other side there would be varying bits of information. But the image of Hercules that was portrayed on his coins was remarkably similar to Alexander himself. And so he would portray himself in the likeness of, you know, the Greek god of strength. And, and so that was the first. And then I think a couple of generations after Alexander, by that point, they would then start, um stamping coins with alexander's head uh but by this point you know when it when he's been dead for two generations you know what was a uh, uh you know he's gradually achieving godlike status right, right, right. Yeah. you know if you think of your sporting heroes uh you, you know the the best bar i don't know who the best basketball player is today but you know or the best you know joe dimaggio for example the great baseball player of maybe the 1950s is it yeah, yeah, yeah. I th- yeah, sounds so right. So he already has this sort of godlike status, doesn't yeah. he? He's no longer just a, a guy who hit balls. He's a, and 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 so you know the sport and you know Pele was just a football player, a very good football player. But by the time two or three generations gone, and suddenly he's a god. Yeah. So I think the same applies. You, you know, you might just be a man, and you but by the time myth and legend and history, and they all get confused. <laughs> that's how that's how gods are born. Yeah. And then you know, eventually you would see. Like the Romans, for example, and I love this story, the Romans would stamp their coins eventually with the heads of, of emperors. And often when, when um, uh, a new emperor uh, had, had come to power, they would stamp a coin with one emperor holding a globe and passing that globe to the new emperor. The old emperor passing the globe to the new emperor. So I think, for example, the coins of Trajan did that. Mm-hmm. Now, there's two interesting things to notice there. Firstly, it shows that the Romans knew the world was round uh-huh. <laughs> because, you know, the globe symbolized right. the empire. Way before and Columbus. So, oh, way before Columbus. Yeah. And I think that flat earth theory that everyone thought the earth was flat at some, I think that's been debunked actually. Oh. But it certainly seems that in the dark ages, certain certain people stopped believing that the earth was round. It definitely, I think there's some truth to that. And, and, but anyway, um, the, yes, so you see, so the Romans would, you know, communicate the fact that there was a new emperor on their coins. Mm. And, you know, so, uh, uh, and, and the, the coins stamp is always, even today, you know, the, 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 the US dollar is stamped with the heads of great rulers. Do you know, George Washington is no longer just a bloke. He's a god in right. the eyes of, of many in, of American legends. Yeah. And so you would have George Washington, or I don't even know who's on your coins anymore, but certainly George Washington and maybe Benjamin Franklin and... Yeah, Abe Lincoln, Thomas Jefferson. Um, that's all that comes to mind. Uh, oh, Benjamin Franklin. Yeah, but ben Franklin's the $100 sure. bill. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the, it's a means of... So money was is used as propaganda in that respect. And... Coming back to Greece and Rome and then Byzantium after Rome and the Islamic empire and pretty much every empire in history, there's, you can, 
if you plotted the greatness of that empire on a graph and you plotted the soundness of the money mm -hmm. of that empire on a graph, the two would coincide. Right. And I've been trying to figure out in my head, is it failing to keep the money sound that leads to the decline of the empire? Or is it the decline of the empire that leads to failing to keep the money sound? The two seem to dance together. I don't know which causes which or, you know, is it causation or correlation? I don't really know. Mm -hmm. do, do, but, you know, you see it time and time again. And obviously, you know, US coming off the gold standard in 1971, Britain coming off the gold yeah. standard in 1914. But the money was sound before the empire was great. <clears throat> and, you know, the decline of Roman money, it, it was Nero. Uh, so the Republic was no more. It was now an empire. And it was Nero in the late first century who was the first person to debase the coinage, the denarius. But that process of going from 100% silver to 0% silver took about 300 years. Right. And the biggest, most fastest debasement happened in the last you know, 20 or 30 years. Yeah. So the process was gradual. But Nero was the first, and maybe 20 or 30 years after Nero was the point at which the Roman Empire reached its greatest extent. Mm -hmm. And at that point, it started coming back. Now, the standard argument that's used as to why Rome declined uh, or why Rome debased its money is that the cost of its government uh, couldn't be met by the cost of its, by its tax revenue. But what we often forget in that is that Rome's greatest source of tax revenue and pretty much empires, every empire's greatest source of tax revenue comes from conquering other countries. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, <laughs> you yeah. know, you conquer the other countries and you take control not only of the tax base, but you take control of the land, the labor, the produce, the profits, the, the tax base, basically. But so you conquer the other country, you take its gold and silver, you melt it down, you melt its own coinage, you loot and so on. And um, and we can start talking about tax in, the, in a moment. But the so this the point at which Rome stopped expanding, so it no longer had the revenue of newly conquered territories, the loot, the, the taxes, however, whatever form that revenue took, was when Rome started having to pay for itself and it couldn't mm -hmm, without mm -hmm. that extra new money supply. And that's when it started debasing its currency and then gradually it started shrinking, shrinking, shrinking. And so, yeah. Super interesting. Um, there's this, I think I may have mentioned this last time, but uh, there's a piece written by Frederick C. Lane called the consequences, I'm sorry, the economic consequences of organized violence. And he describes something similar where the, basically we start out in a state of anarchy, then a couple of local, uh, the guys carrying the biggest sticks or the, the, the best specialist in violence sort of establish an enclave, right? They, they put up walls and they say, we're, uh, we are the government effectively. They run the show in that area and they start taxing the tax base. And then the, the territory itself expands over time, but when it runs out of uh, room to expand for whatever reason, it hits the water, it runs up against some other topography maybe that it can't conquer. Um, that's when they, that's, they start like inflating the currency because they can't expand the revenues anymore to your point, right? The increase in tax revenues is typically coming from newly conquered lands. So when you run out of newly conquered lands, you start taxing your tax base harder. The easiest way to tax your tax base is to inflate essentially your coin clip, which is what they used to do. Um, and there was a great line in your book I'd read earlier, like um, it was describing the Laffer curve where oh, the, yeah. your tax revenues are actually optimized at kind of a midpoint. It's not the high, the more you increase your tax rates, you don't increase tax revenues. There's there's diminishing returns, and then negative returns at some point because people start to skirt the taxes or they move or or whatever, and uh, and that's something that's been known for a really long time. Um, and the other the it's other a lesson point, that seems continually to need relearning. Yes, but higher tax rates do not lead to greater tax revenue. <laughs> yeah, but again, it's, governments, it, you know, they never want to relinquish, right? They never want to lo actually lower taxes because that's to giving up revenue, even though they could increase their total revenues by lowering the tax rate. 
um, yeah, it's amazing. I think it's, it's, it's partly about revenue, but it's partly about control. Mm-hmm. I think there's just some people that feel this innate need to control other people. Right. I don't know what drives it, but they don't like it when you're doing this or doing that, that this, that, and the other. Even if it makes no difference to them, yeah. they get outraged by it and they feel the need to to control it. This and and it's it's often somebody who's you know making good. It's often sort of politics of envy, and it and it, it is quite a sort of lefty authoritarian thing, and it's yeah. quite a sort of um, re- religions used to do it as well. Oh, you mustn't do this. You mustn't do that. And, and y- y- you know, a lot of the traditions of religion have a very, you know, religion, religion existed before media mm. and a lot of religions, you know, not eating pork, for example, there's quite a sensible practical reason why that law was there because people were getting ill from making pork and the easiest way to stop people eating pork is to, to make it a sin yeah. for the, a lot of stuff. But a lot of the time it is, it is just politics of empathy. Yeah. Oh, I don't like it that that guy's doing this. And with social media and, and the right, the, this sort of controlling instinct everybody has. And it's just amazing how pissed off some people get at other people doing stuff, even though what the other person is doing, it, it, it harms nobody else. Yeah. It, <clears throat> I wonder if, I don't know. Yeah. Where does that instinct come from? I mean, I guess it is just people trying to, do something that profits them, right? If you realize you have a physical coercive advantage over someone else or a group of other people, you just seek to exploit that control. Is it about the profit or is it about just the power? I think it's the, I'm not even sure it is the profit. I think maybe it's limiting the profits of others increases your own profit, I suppose. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's, it's envy. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, uh, it's, you know, jealousy, I suppose, jealousy and envy are sort of quite close together. It's, but there's just this instinct to control. I can't have other people getting on. And it's worse in Europe than it is in America, but it's getting bad in America. Yeah. Yeah. It's just something that disturbs me at a very deep level. Like I don't want to control anyone, nor do I want to be controlled in any way. And that just intuitively, intuitively to me makes the most sense it's like of course we would figure out the best way to organize ourselves if we just honored kind of those basic principles right of preserving life liberty and property um but clearly we, we veered far away from that and the other point i think you make is that you make which is great is that actions speak louder than words prices communicate action right our words you know talk is cheap but what you buy and sell, what you actually put your skin in the game um, to modify in the world, that's what really matters. It's mm. like that old, that like old if I quote. tell you to buy this, you're not going to buy that. Or if I say this is really cheap, you might look at it. But if you look at it and you go, oh, that's only $10, yeah. you'll buy it. Right. <laughs> it's like that quote, so, uh, don't tell me what you think, just show me what's in your portfolio. Yeah. And this is one, and like this particular topic, is so poorly understood today. Like we, 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 we have reverence for free speech, I'd say in the United States and most, most of Western civilization, but we don't acknowledge that prices are speech too, right? Like at a very fundamental level, both are expressions of the logos and the logos means word or ratio roughly. And a price is just an exchange ratio. And, uh, you know, words are ratios of meaning, if you will, and prices are ratios of, of action and economic value. And to, to disturb either, either via propaganda or central banking, it breaks down the coordination of, of economic mm. activity and social cohesion. Um, I listened to Nassim Taleb's, and I know he's sort of pers- persona non grata, <laughs> in Bitcoin <laughs> circles since he sold his Bitcoins. But yeah. I listened to his audio book of Skin in the Game the other day and I thought it was great. Yeah. And it would be it would be great if if somebody could invent um like he tells you what to look out for mm-hmm. and he tells you the signals and you can smell them. And often it's he articulates what a lot of people knew but they weren't quite able to articulate. Mm-hmm. But it would be great if if somebody could invent some kind of skin in the game barometer. Skin, you know what what I mean? skin in the game, what? A skin in the game barometer. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah. So you could tell exactly how much, um, you know, by what they say and by what they do and so on, how yeah. much skin in the game they've actually got. 
Yeah. And and then if we could see that, you know, in this they had that attached to their social media profile. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be great to have one of those It'd be very for useful. Like a whole country, right? It's like yeah. The US has an average of 40% skin in the game because that would be directly related to uh, the cohesion of the civilization as well. Yeah, um, I mean, there's there's an argument here. You know, the 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 argument is one person, one vote, and they keep trying to bring down the voting age here in the UK to 16. But you know, my 16 year old kids are clueless about politics. They 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 mm-hmm. either will echo what I say or they'll just echo what their teacher says at school. Mm-hmm. And I actually think there's a strong case to be made for the voting age to be made older. Mm-hmm. not younger. Um, the left tend to argue for a younger voting age because they get more votes that way. Mm-hmm. Younger people tend to be more left-wing. And by the way, I don't even necessarily subscribe to that whole left-right thing. I, I'm much more of a left-right authoritarian, libertarian, political compass person. But for the sake of that particular yeah. argument, it, I, I'm using that. Um, but there's a strong argument that, one, you should only be allowed to vote once you've paid taxes for a certain amount of time. Mm-hmm. No, because then you do have skin in the game. Mm-hmm. And then you could take that argument one stage further and say, the more you pay in tax, the more you contribute to the system, in other words, the more your vote counts. Right. And people would say, well, that's outrageous because, um, you know, that favors rich people. Well, yes, it does. But they pay more tax. They contribute more. Mm-hmm. They might not you might not like the fact that they do, but their money goes to doing more than, than no money does. Mm-hmm. Um, and you could then go one stage further than that and go, you know, like the ancient Greeks did where tax was voluntary. I think we talked, did we talk about mm-hmm. that on the last show? We did, the, the liturgy, Voluntary right? tax, yeah, liturgy, exactly. Yeah. Um, if you could reintroduce such a system here and, and, and with hypothecated taxes. So I'm going to spend an extra $5 in my tax this month, but I'm only going to, I want to know that that $5 is not just going on everything. I want to know that that $5 is specifically going to help the homeless. Mm-hmm. Well, that $5 is specifically going to, you know, education or whatever area of government spending you wanted to go to. And the person who pays that extra $5 feels all great. You know, that's quite a nice mm-hmm. incentive for them. And, but the, the, if you have that sort of hypothecated system, you know, the more you pay in taxes, so you can pay a little bit extra and your vote counts for that little bit more. It's a bit like, I don't know if you follow the coin Decred, but they've got this whole um, staking and you can buy tickets. And then once you've got tickets, you can then vote on how Decred operates and spends its money and makes its decisions. It's quite a very nice governance system. Mm. And uh, you, if you could do that at the society level, it'd be rather nice. Yeah. No, it, yeah, it's... I'm very skeptical of the whole voting process entirely. Like I think, oh, it's I, a joke. I often say that money is the only vote that counts ultimately. Um, is, yeah, I don't know. I think we're going to get past this somehow. It's we're in a in a Bitcoin world where you would be able to more freely negotiate your tax. Who, who do you treaties. want, the orcs, orcs or the goblins? Which which which, which yeah, force yeah. do you want? <laughs> but the the. That's right. It'd be kind of choosing the the lesser of a lot of evils. But the 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 flip side of that is governments are going, in theory at least, or will be forced to deal with you more honestly, because you as a you as a citizen will have so much optionality. Like your capital can just move anywhere. So if you don't like the way you're being treated, you can very easily move to another country. They can't impose capital controls. They can't hit you with an exit tax. They can't inflate you. Um, I, assuming we're on a Bitcoin standard, right? The citizen mm-hmm. just gains a lot more leverage in their negotiations with the nation state. So the nation state starts to look much more like a private enterprise um, with better offerings, better pricing, et cetera. Um, but who knows? You know, I, it, it calls into question a lot of things for me um, because then- Unrealistic. I was just going to say- ask, the, Do you go? The, the last thing on that is the thing that I can't get my head around is in that world- monetary property is the only thing you want to own. Like you only want to own Bitcoin. You want to rent everything else, right? Because if you own land in this alternate future, that's something they can confiscate from you very easily. But Bitcoin is a thing you can move, you know, with pretty much absolute impunity. So it's like we moved to this world where 
Bitcoin is a superior property right in a way. You want to own as much Bitcoin as you can, but rent everything else. Yeah, and that's um, that's very interesting. And I do think, um, like Klaus Schwab of the World Economic Forum, um, one of the things he said was that by 2030, you won't own anything. Yeah, and fucking scary. And, and this <laughs> it is scary. And, yeah. and, and the intention behind that phrase, I think, has been slightly distorted because um, everyone is now saying, oh, the World Economic Forum wants to impoverish everyone and governments own everything. And it's mm. been misconstrued, that statement. I think the point he was making is that, you know, owning a Rolls Royce is too much hassle. You'll just rent it when you need it. Or, mm -hmm. or, you know, rather than owning a huge mansion in, in, in the country, you'll just rent it when you yeah. want to use it. I think that was, you know, it was the rise of Airbnb and yeah, Uber yeah. and all these sharing uh, platforms. I think yeah. that was the, the point he was making. But in any case, um, that trend of renting rather than owning very much ties in with this other trend of the sovereign individual, mm -hmm. you know, not spending too long in any given jurisdiction, uh, not clear who he pays taxes to. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, this new digital economy that exists beyond national borders, it's such a fascinating dynamic that's mm -hmm. going on. And, you know, as soon as, that sovereign individual feels in any kind of way threatened or jeopardized in one jurisdiction, he simply moves to another mm -hmm. and, you know, and takes his Bitcoins with it. Yeah. It's rather a nice, it's rather a nice model. And I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, it's quite difficult with kids, <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, it's certainly doable if I think you start out, but if like, for example, it's a lifestyle I want for myself, but I've got kids who are 20, 18, 16 right. and 15. And it's just, it's hard. So I'm sort of taking steps to engineer that existence for myself a few years yeah. down the line, but, but I'm away, away from it yet. Yeah. Someone told but, me that having kids is like casting out anchor in a way. And, um, I, so in that world though, where we're, we're all renting, that's my question is who's, who owns it? Everyone's looking to rent the property. Who's, who is the, the rentor? Well, the queen. Yeah, I guess the local monarch <laughs> or what? Yeah. I mean, existing landowners. Yeah. You know, I mean, I've got a little bit of of, of uh, real estate in, in the UK. I've got a, 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 I'm a, you know, it's one of the best ways to hedge against a basement of currencies to own mm -hmm. real estate. Right. And I'm not going to sell it because it's, I, I incur capital gains. To, I incur all, it's I'm just easier just to sit there yeah. and I rent it out. Uh, and the rent sort of covers my outgoings, but barely. I yeah. sometimes sit there and I go, with all the hassle I have renting out, I may as well just leave it vacant. But you, you kind of need somebody yeah. in a property, otherwise it, it think stuff starts going wrong. But yeah. but yeah, I mean, I guess there will not everyone's going to be a Bitcoiner, and there'll be some people who who make businesses renting stuff to to Bitcoiners. You know, it'd be probably be good money. Yeah, yeah, interesting to think. But about. how what, I, something I fascinate, you know, it's the dream of of every. Bitcoiner and and even before Bitcoin was is you know creating a new society, mm -hmm. creating a new uh, country where we don't make any of the mistakes that are embedded in existing countries and where you know we can set our own rules and and um, and maybe the rule is that there are no rules you know mm -hmm. but the but this new land this um, oh, hang on a minute sorry my mother's calling on the other line. Um, <laughs> and, uh, I've, the, so, so that's the dream, this, this, the, the, and, and then there's a lot of talk about Bitcoin citadels and maybe little enclaves form up around, you know, remote mining jurisdictions where they're exploiting cheap energy, mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. nobody particularly wants the land anyway. But I mean, how realistic do you think, is it really these citadels are they only really going to exist digitally? Uh, because do you think they'll ever, ever actually going to exist physically? I would, uh, again, following just the sovereign individual thesis. Yeah. I think they would ultimately be physical jurisdictions. Um, and uh, yeah, I get, again, in that world where you want to own Bitcoin and rent everything else, it seems like all the other property rights would kind of revert back to 
either locally enforced or somehow uh, enforced via a smart contract schema. There's things happening. There's a, a higher order protocol on Bitcoin called RG, RGB, and it enables people to execute private smart contracts between two consenting parties. So maybe property sort of as government revenues, government nation state revenues are basically starved to death. They're going to fragment and fail kind of, you know, uh, a la USSR late 20th century kind of thing. And I think a lot of the functions they provide today. So when you have to go and register your title with the local UK land registry, or whoever, maybe you're just going to register that land ownership with a different governing body um, and probably a smaller governing body. So I would, I do anticipate the fragmentation of the nation state. I just don't think that giant industrial age model holds up in the 21st century, but I don't know how much, like how small they will fragment. Uh, but I do see governance, you know, again, I just see governance becoming a more localized affair once again, kind of how it started, right? We started with just local monopolies on violence yeah. that preserved your property. And then the industrial age blew it up to this, uh, these giant nation states we have today. Um, I think the 21st century just takes it back the other direction. Maybe. I mean, I can't see how, how long can these deficits go on for? How long can a government carry on spending so much more than it earns? So long as things inflate. Yeah. And like I, I mentioned this before, I, I started getting into gold in 2005. Hmm. And this narrative was so strong then. And, and I look, used to look at it and go, this cannot go on. This cannot go on. But that was 16 years ago. Mm -hmm. And it goes on and on and on. The deficits get worse and worse and worse. The numbers get more and more ridiculous. And I guess it's just a bit like Rome. You know, I mean, Rome did it for 300 years, but they did not did it to the same extent that we're doing it now. Mm -hmm. And But I guess it just suddenly, at a certain point, the light, I don't believe the lights go off because there's too much vested interest in keeping things going because nobody wants there to be no electricity and you know which is almost too sophisticated for there to be no electricity and you know even when covid came you know in the supply chain there was a big run on the supermarkets and the shelves really were bare for a couple of days it was quite scary mm -hmm. but the supply chain sorted it out it was amazing how quickly all the supply chain sorted it out mm -hmm. and within a few and, and but these are private enterprises remember these are supermarkets not government bodies but they had food on the shelves within a few days and it was it's pretty impressive on behalf of them so i guess very quickly the market would just shift to using some other kind of money that that works mm -hmm. i guess that was will be what happens i i think about it all the t time how is this going to end mm -hmm. is it going to end or is it just going to sort of you know just sort of do a great long fleur like one of those sort of um air balloons that gradually sort of <laughs> fizzles well, out. I don't know. It's like your point well, earlier about Nero, you know, the 300 year debasement of the, of silver, I guess is what the, or the denarius they were the basic. Yeah. Then. The gold it, stayed it gradual. The gold then stayed pure, bizarrely. Yeah. 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 But even sudden, like it looks sudden to us, mm -hmm. but sudden then was like 15 years, 10, 10, right. 15 years. <laughs> Do you think we're there today? Cause I, when I look at, the US M1, M2 charts. I mean, we've been doing gradual for a long time, basically since the end of World War II. It really ramped up after 1971. It really ramped up after 2008. And now it's just full on, the money supply is parabolic. Yeah, I mean, it's going so parabolic, it's almost going up backwards and over the top. Over it's it. broken, yeah. They discontinued like, the charts in the US. <laughs> yeah, it, but it, the, the insane thing is, Robert, It like if you took that chart and you 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 stopped it in 2008 when you were looking at the the chart then or 2009 or 2011 whatever it's always looked that parabolic it just gets more and more parabolic mm. it's just um so i I've, i mean i've stopped they've stopped putting up the charts i've stopped looking at them because i i just <laughs> <laughs> I, I've, it's just ridiculous so um and europe's worse than the us mm. It really is. I mean, you look at spending in, in, and all this sleight of hand that goes on with the numbers. Mm. 
And um, I don't know. Yeah, the the distribution this time is different. Like clearly we've we've gone to full helicopter money. You know, 2008 was kind of the recapitalization of the banks. Now they're just doling it out. And I think that that's the last straw because no one will ever repeal that. So now we're just going to no. accelerate monetary issuance until inflation rips society apart. Well, the thing is, though, there is still extraordinary deflationary pressure. Mm -hmm. And the deflationary pressure is the incredible progress that technology is making mm -hmm. and the incredible um, improvements in productivity that we're seeing. And that is an enormous deflationary pressure. And the other deflationary pressure is the enormous difference in costs in the developing world, in China and Asia, compared to costs in Western Europe and, and America. And as long as you know, China can go on exporting its deflation, exporting its cheap costs, yeah. and, and the West benefits from those cheap prices, we're not going to get inflate. And, and again, food productivity uh, is just you know forget like you know really hipster steak and 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 uh you know hipster beers and homebrew you know the clever little beers and gold but just general it's really easy to produce extraordinary amounts of food at a very low cost mm -hmm. you can pay more if you want to but if you want to spend nothing on food you can and so that means aside from housing the actual cost of living or the cost of living, according to CPI, mm -hmm. the measures they use for inflation, can stay at 2 or 3%. And they can go, look, inflation is only 2 or 3%. Of course, as we all know, that 2 or 3% in CPI is only responsible for about 10% of money supply growth. Most of new money supply goes into financial assets and goes into housing. Right. And that's where we see extraordinary inflation. Yeah. But, but th as long as they can keep... The, you know, I talked about a sleight of hand. As long as they can keep fudging the numbers and lie about it in CPI, they don't need to put up rates and the longer the process can go on for. So, again, we talked about truth. There's no truth to the inflation numbers. They, right. they measure the cost of a certain basket of goods, not money supply. And yeah. inflation, the original definition of inflation meant the inflating, the blowing up of the money supply with the consequence of higher prices. I'm sounding like Peter Schiff, but the... Uh, you know, he's very right when he talks about this kind of thing. And, um, you know, he's on the money with it. And so, I, 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 I'm, I, as I say, for 15 years, I've been thinking, when does this end? And, it, and they can manage to keep it going. Yeah. I'm not even sure they're aware of what they're keeping going. You know, the way economics is taught, money doesn't even matter. Mm -hmm. That's right. You know, money shouldn't have a cost of production to it, according to, you know, orthodox economics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's treated, government's treated as God, effectively. It suffers no trade-offs. It just puts money in, takes money out to manage, quote-unquote, manage the economy. Like, it's just some simple lever, like little simple machine they're walking around the world. But um, the reality I had this is... debate, yeah. I had this debate with this um, mainstream economist. Nice lady. And... Um, and she, we were talking about Bitcoin. Of course, she was saying Bitcoin isn't backed by anything. <laughs> and I was going, what's fiat money backed by? And she was going, it's backed by the state. And I'm like, hello? Uh, they uh, just didn't get it. It's funny. Um, so I guess uh, just taking it back to the conversation arc here. So we're, we're deep you know, it started with the printing press, effectively, which I've always thought this was interesting that the printing press was the technology that disrupted the church's monopoly on knowledge. But today, it's the tech, the same technology, more or less. I mean, it's not really a printing press anymore, but was used to expand and manipulate money supplies and reinforce the state's monopoly on people's time, effectively, giving them the ability to steal at scale. Um, I just, this, you asked how long it can go on. I just have a really hard time envisioning a world where this model of outright extortion, right? We're just extorting people, basically. It's like pay the taxes or use this dollar or suffer consequences while they're backdoor siphoning wealth out of it via inflation. I have a very hard time seeing 
that model persisting in a world where ideas move so quickly and like me, like something gets memed, like, again, maybe we talked about mm. this last time, but if they can just print money, why do I pay taxes? Like you just put yeah. that into a meme, that thing spreads like wildfire. And all of a sudden people are asking these questions. And next thing you know, it's like, okay, the question about inflation is now being asked. And when you mm. look behind that question, that you see the illusion, right? It's like the whole thing is a scam. Every every fiat currency in the world is a pyramid scheme. So I don't know. I don't know if people are going to wake up to that in uh, you know a month, twenty years. But I don't think it's sustainable in the long run. Well, more and more people are. I mean, then we have Bitcoin to thank for this because it is That's proved. We talk right. about money as communication. Yeah. But, you know, Bitcoin has been the most wonderful educational tool. And I think I mentioned this before, you know, when I was starting out writing about all this before Bitcoin was invented, I'd have to take three sentences in every article I wrote explaining what fiat money is. Mm -hmm. and now you just go on a Bitcoin exchange and there's one column that says fiat and there's another that says crypto. It's just everybody knows. Yeah. And so, you know, Bitcoin has been wonderful in that respect, a wonderful educative tool. And coming back to the, but, and I was about to say, listening to you talk, well, you know, there are people in North Korea, there were people in Soviet Russia who lived their whole lives and never knew any different. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, this sort of strong overbearing government can go on for a lot longer than you think. Mm. But then you added that phrase, in a society in which ideas can spread. Mm -hmm. Now, ideas couldn't spread in North Korea That's or right. Soviet Russia, and they can. So that is the essential difference. And that makes me very optimistic. Sorry. And the let's just talk a bit more about the printing press, because, you know, the, we, 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 this, we come to the theme of money as communication. And, you know, the printing press was used to print words and then disseminate words over time and distance. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and in fact, one of the reasons I think why we have this podcast boom going on at the moment is that the human brain actually absorbs words better through the ear. Yeah. We're, we're wired to, and, and so information goes in more easily and stays there longer through the year. Mm -hmm. And we only invented words as a means to, you know, transmit information beyond the, the distance that the human voice could spread it for. Mm -hmm. And now we have podcasts and, and all the associated technology. <laughs> it's, yeah. I mean, that's why the, the boom is going on because the, the brain likes information spread like this. But the, the printing press was there to disseminate information, but one of the first uses it found was of course to print money and we in in western europe we think we invented the pre-printing press but china had its own version of the printing press maybe a thousand years before we did mm -hmm. and marco polo was a venetian merchant and uh, he's seen as a great he's they call him an explorer now <laughs> and, and a writer but really he was a merchant he was going out from venice to Asia in order to buy and sell goods and try and make money mm -hmm. and be kept a chronicle of it in his, uh, in his, in his famous diaries. And when he went to, um, Kublai Khan's, uh, China, he marveled at the fact that they used paper as money because that hadn't happened in Europe yet, because they'd already invented the printing press in China. And there's a great, there's a great quote, but it's a sort of, it's, it's slightly sinister at the same time, but I'll read it to you. With these pieces of paper made as I have described, he, Kublai Khan, causes all payments on his own account to be made, and he makes them to pass current universal, universally over all his kingdoms and provinces and territories, and with whithersoever his power and sovereignty extends. And nobody however important he may think himself, dares to refuse them on pain of death. <laughs> <laughs> and indeed, everybody takes them readily. For wherever so a person may, person may go throughout the great Khan's dominions, he shall find these pieces of paper current and shall be able to transact all sales and purchases of goods by means of them, just as well as if they were coins of pure gold. And all the while, they are so light that 10 bezants worth doesn't weigh one golden bezant. 
Wow. And it's a great quote. So the paper money was being used and the technology, we, we talked about money as technology and whatever is used as money develops as technology develops. Mm -hmm. And, you know, all the cryptographic breakthroughs and the blockchain is why we have Bitcoin now. But the, the printing press was a technological breakthrough. And on the one hand, and people used it because it's more convenient carrying paper than it is bits of gold. And the, the paper was interchangeable for gold. It's not clear from Marco Polo's quote whether you could exchange your paper there for gold. Or I think Kublai Khan took the gold and merchants entering the, the um, dominions would have to change their gold for paper as they came in mm. and thereby did Kublai Khan control it. So it's pretty clear that that was a, a fiat money system in China. And um, it's also probably, <laughs> you know, China went into a massive dark age yeah. uh, starting probably I think its peak was probably before Marco Polo went there. Mm -hmm. And it's, again, we're back to this thing. They started using paper money. It wasn't back for anything. And China went into its dark age. And time and again, an empire's money is sound when it's on the rise, I guess. And we can talk about China now because uh, there's some very interesting things going on with China. Now, you know, when you look at human rights and a lot of the other things that China does, it isn't necessarily the most admirable administration that you've ever seen in your life. And, you know, it's a very authoritarian form of capitalism that they, they go by there. But they have, over the course of the last 25 years, been accumulating extraordinary amounts of gold. Mm -hmm. And I've done an audit on this. I've spent some time working it out in an article. Did we? We didn't talk about this last I time. I think I think we did. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I'll, you really I'll cut opened to the my chain. eyes. You opened my eyes to this. That they have. I think it was fourteen thousand tons of gold. Yeah. yeah. Was the final Precisely number? Precisely yeah. that. Yeah. I, I beg your pardon, and I beg your pardon, dear listener, for for repeating no, myself. All right. um, but they have as much gold as America does, and I believe that seventy-five percent of Bitcoin mining takes place in China as well. Perhaps not and by the design of the government but it nevertheless it takes place there and i suppose the chinese government could seize those mining operations if it wanted to but so now you tend to associate sound money whether it's bitcoin or gold with sound administrations and you might say well china's not that admirable but you know it's 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 a not very well kept secret that china has designs on global reserve currency status and the fact that it's accumulating all that gold and there's all that Bitcoin mining there makes that look like a, a real possibility. And maybe, you know, China becomes the dominant nation. I mean, I have to say if America took on China in a world war, I would probably bet on China. I might be wrong, but the, I, I don't know, heaven knows who'd win that one, but the, the, I think America's probably got the um, stronger weapons at this point, but China's got the, probably the more loyal, citizenry than america does a larger a, army too i think they're well the it's like three times the, the soldiers as, as the u.s i've read that as well but then there's another statistic that does the, the rounds that the, the american military is the largest employer in the world but maybe mm. the actual soldiers china's mm. higher yeah um, but anyway, and we, we, let's not speculate on who wins <laughs> in a world war between China and America. But the point is that China, you know, America and Western Europe are the empires in decline and their money's going up the spout. And China's pegged its money to the US dollar for now. And then at some point it abandons that and it will have a sound backing to its money to fall back on, if that makes sense. Yeah. And so even China today is following the sound money route that yes. rising empires follow. Right. Yeah. And I, it seems logical that it would wait for the opportune time when, you know, there should, there should be some shock to the dollar at some point, given the rate of production that then China would try to step in and insert its digital yuan or whatever, maybe gold yeah. digital yuan, uh, I assume as the, I mean, does China, does China asset. pull the plug or does America pull the plug on itself at which point China bails, you right. know, we don't know which order that's going to happen. In. And they hold but America, you know, America had sound money 
before America was great. I mean, yeah. America doesn't call itself an empire, but it sort of is. Mm. And, um, yeah. you know, England went on the gold standard, the great recoinage of Isaac Newton in 1716. And England was not an empire or Britain was not an empire in 1716. Mm. You know, the, so we had sound money and then the, the imperial expansion followed. Yeah. I think the, the story you bring up, uh, with China, I think they were the first civilization to implement fiat currency at scale. So the story you were telling, um, yeah. And it ended like all fiat currency experiments ended in hyperinflation and kind of a dark age. Um, in China, you know, they're just infamously always the furthest out on the technology curve for some reason. I don't yeah. know, they just figure things out. The Islamic first. empire, by the way, followed the same trajectory. Money was sound at first. And yeah. Islam was a great empire. The Islamic contribution to science and mathematics in the sort of in the in the eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh, and twelfth century was astonishing. And then it went into its own yeah. dark age. Yeah, and um, the, to the modern uh, component there of China, I, they also hold about a trillion dollars in U.S. Treasuries. I think. <laughs> yeah. That's so, the other thing. Like China is really the one two punch here. America's gold is about 77% of its foreign exchange holdings. Mm -hmm. China's gold, or well, the nominal amount that it holds, is like 3%. Right. <laughs> it's, yeah. Yeah, it's 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 incredible. They've got they're the ones carrying the can of all those stupid bonds. So there's the possibility of, you know, dollar shock. China introduces digital gold-backed yuan. China dumps U.S. Treasuries on the open market. I mean, that would be that would sow the seeds for something for a lot of contention yeah. between the U.S. Yeah, I mean, that's how the racket's being perpetrated now. Mm -hmm. Is that Western central banks are buying their own bonds? They're mm -hmm. buying their own debt, yeah. so they're monetizing debt. Yeah, and I think I'm going to get wrong, but I think we're somewhere between thirty and fifty percent of government debt is now central bank owned. Yeah. And, and on when the, the point yeah. at which, you know, it used to be until quantitative easing came along, money was created by banks lending. Mm -hmm. That was how money, you know, very little of money was actually printed by governments. There was the notes and the dollars, but that's like three or 4% of actual money supply. Mm -hmm. But now with quantitative easing, central bank and, and, and buying government debt with it, central banks are printing money. And they're printing more and more of it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And there's nothing to hold them back. And I, I don't know what the tipping point is. Is it 50% of government debt? Is it 60% of government debt? But, and they say they, and, and that is what, it's their printing money that keeps the cost of servicing that debt so low. Mm -hmm. That's right. But at, at a certain point, it's going to be, and we at UK pension funds are obliged to own UK government debt right. because it's low risk. Yeah. Is it the same limit? Okay. Yeah. So that. I mean, it's state sponsored, so it can go on for longer than you think, but that it's unsustainable. Yeah, which There's just the, gives you know, them a way, you know, those are some of the largest capital pools too. Um, and that just gives the government a way to pillage the wealth of those capital pools through inflation. Mm. Um it's the it, I think the, the bond market's three or four times the size of the equities market. I think it's something like that. It's much uh, bigger. Globally or yeah, well, either globally or at home. Yeah, I think I don't know. I, I want to say globally, it's at least two X. I'm not sure. It might be three yeah. X. Um, the other thing, just in terms of tipping points, you just mentioned another one I'm watching for here in the U.S. is the debt servicing cost. So just the mm. interest on the national debt will exceed total U.S. tax revenues. I think this year. It might be next year. Um, probably already has happened with it. This was before COVID that I looked at this analysis. So that what that introduces is the need to print money just to cover the interest expense on the national debt. So you have to money ball the interest. And historically, no nation has ever recovered from that. That you That's just like stage one to hyperinflation. How can you recover from that? You can't. It's impossible. I, I, I think in the UK, I, I, in 2016, I can tell you that the cost of the servicing the debt was half the education budget. So it was about 7 or 8% of national expenditure. Mm. And I imagine that's gone up to 15 to 20% now. Yeah. But to, are you sure it's a 50%? 50% is extraordinary, but it will, whether we, we're there now or not, we will get there. And, and again, that's when you get to tipping point and it will all look so obvious after the event. Of course. Yeah. We, we've, 
it's funny you brought up earlier the fiat currency thing. Like I've been using that term. I because I fell down the central banking rabbit hole in early 2000s. So I used to tell people about fiat currency and all the problems and no one knew what it meant. <laughs> but it's amazing how much our perceptions have changed on the world as a, you know, as you said, as a result of Bitcoin. I think it's been this great educational tool. And that's, you know, that's where my optimism lies too. It's that I think we're just going to get smarter. I think just lowering the cost of information distribution is just going to make people wise up to this scam. And I can't see it. I can't see it persisting in its current form. Mm. Um, but but who knows? Um, the more and more people are using crypto, and particularly young people. Mm -hmm. And you know, without any prompting from me, my eldest son is at university. Him and all his mates are all using it to buy weed or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, but they're using it. And his mate who didn't get into university is now a cryptocurrency trader mm. <laughs> <laughs> and he's making more money than any of them. Well, fair play to him. It'll yeah. go tits up when the market goes tits yeah, up as it for will. The next but, six but, months. <laughs> yeah. But he's fine for now. Yeah. And, but the, so the other day I, how old are you, Robert? 35. Okay. So I'm, I'm 51. And as I think, you know, I've been involved in, uh, projecting these uh, uh, unacceptable messages on the exteriors of various buildings. In I find London. them quite acceptable. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I've been having a great time. And But I hired this projectionist who's a, his job is he's a guerrilla projectionist and he gets hired by corporations and stuff to project, you know, whatever message on the building. But he does his guerrilla projections as a sort of nighttime bit of moonlighting. And um, I was able to beat him down on price by promising to playing him in Bitcoin. Mm. And he said that it was from buying some Bitcoin and then selling it that he was able to get his first projector. It was huh. the profits he made on Bitcoin that bought him his first projector. And then the sort of um, irony of that is he's now using that projector to promote Bitcoin messages. <laughs> and he said, I've given him, oh, so I've paid him in some more Bitcoin now. And he loves it. And his girlfriend and I was saying, I've got. Um, I know you're a maximalist, so I'm, I'm. I'm uttering heritage, but I said I've got some other coins. You want me to pay you in one of those? And you get you're interested in one of those? And his girlfriend's going, No, no, no. It's just got to be Bitcoin. It's just got to be Bitcoin. <laughs> and he's going, No, no. I want to try the other one. She's but his keeper. girlfriend got a. Yeah, yeah. The, his girlfriend got the way. She won that particular argument. But the the point is, is that. You know, he's, there's loads of people who are doing little bits of job. More and more people are wanting to be paid in crypto. Mm -hmm. And the more people that want to be paid in crypto, the, 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 the quicker this game ends and the, yes. the, the, the quicker the ascendancy of crypto.